This video is filled to the brim with spoilers. If you haven't played Yakuza 0 and want to be in the dark, I've provided some timestamps to the points where I stopped talking about story-based content. However, if you don't care for spoilers, then keep watching. Regardless of what you decide, I hope you enjoy this video. I remember around a year ago, I just bought myself a PlayStation 4 along with a handful of games, using them as a means of distracting myself from all the nothing I was preoccupied with during my summer break. While sifting through a sea of games, my eyes would eventually stop on a particular title called Yakuza 0. Upon seeing the game, I thought to myself, I heard about this before from multiple YouTube personalities telling me that the game was amazing, but at the time, I couldn't remember anything specific they said about the game, or even what genre it was in for that matter, only having vague memories of them saying that it's good running through my head. As hesitant as I was on making a near blind purchase, its $50 price tag not helping in the situation, I decided to purchase Yakuza 0 regardless, thinking that since it was a used copy, I could get my money back if I ended up disliking it. What happened next was really surprising. I enjoyed the game. A lot. So much so that after beating it for the first time, I immediately dived back in to record footage for this video. Never in my life have I ever gone back to a game so quickly, especially not one as long as Yakuza 0. But I did, and felt little to no exhaustion despite already experiencing the game in its entirety. When it was all said and done, this game had climbed the ranks, from being an interesting looking title to becoming one of my favorite games of all time, sitting right beside games like Metal Gear Solid 3 and Kingdom Hearts 2, a great feat for my personal standards, especially for a game that I had no prior connection towards. And so, out of passion, boredom, and some other third reason that I honestly forgot along the way, I decided to dedicate an entire video to the game that managed to capture my heart in one fell swoop. Reminiscing on what I found so amazing about the game, and what I thought wasn't so amazing about it. I've got a lot to say, so without any further delay, let us dive right into Yakuza 0. Taking place in the fictional red light district of Kamurocho, Yakuza 0 opens up on a mugging in progress, with the perpetrator being our main character, Kazuma Kiryu, a low-ranking Dojima family Yakuza grunt who's currently fulfilling a debt collection request from a nameless loan shark. After alleviating the target's wallet of the unnecessary weight, and delivering the money to said shark, Kiryu heads out for a night in the town with its sworn brother Nishikiyama. A night filled with horrible leopard print shirts, drunken thuggery, and karaoke sequences. However, when the sun rises, Kiryu encounters the news that changes his life for the rest of the game. Kiryu's target, now known as Taichi Kurihara, was found dead late last night in an abandoned lot. And, since Kiryu was the last person to interact with him, all eyes fall on him for the major suspect behind Taichi's murder. However, not everything is adding up, as during a discussion about punishment Kiryu has with the three lieutenants of the Dojima family, he finds out that Taichi died via bullet wound. And, since Kiryu doesn't use a gun or kill people, well, usually he doesn't, he knows he's being framed for whatever reason, and thanks to a conversation he has with a lieutenant named Kuze, Kiryu was able to shed a bit of light as to why he's being targeted. To make a long exposition sequence short, Kiryu finds out through Kuze, with additional information being provided to him by Kashiwagi, Kazuma Shintaro's right-hand man, that all three of the lieutenants are being ordered to obtain the same piece of land where Taichi died, being referred to by Kuze as the Empty Lot. This land will serve as a linchpin to their property buyout operation, a plan to buy a sizable chunk of Kamurocho in preparation for the district's reconstruction project taking place right in the center of the city. In return for their efforts, the head of the Dojima family, Sohei Dojima, plans to promote the lieutenant who obtains the land to the spot of captain, replacing the currently jailed Kazuma Shintaro, who also happens to be Kiryu's stepfather. However, there's just one problem with this plan. No one knows who owns the land aside from Kazuma, and since he's in jail, this leads everyone to go after the next best target, his stepson Kiryu. Not wanting to be the anchor that drags Kazuma down, Kiryu does his own investigation, starting with the loan shark at the beginning of the story, who had told him about the lot being an excellent place to mug someone. However, when he arrives at the loan shark's office, he finds Kuze as well, who attempts to convince Kiryu that when he turns himself into the cops, to pump Kazuma for information on the empty lot, in return for a guaranteed spot by Kuze's side when he gets out. While Kiryu rejects the offer, he then goes on to converse with both Nishikiyama and Kashiwagi telling them that he plans to have himself exiled from the Dojima family to prevent the false murder accusations from potentially affecting Kazuma's position in the clan, which can possibly drive him to suicide, a common occurrence for Yakuza who fall from high positions in the family. However, both Nishikiyama and Kashiwagi advise against the idea, warning him that if he were to renege on his oath this early in, he'd die for sure. Despite their warnings, Kiryu bolts to Dojima HQ, where he encounters Kuze again, who drills him for his pinky still being on his hand, and offers his earlier proposition again, wanting to know if Kiryu would really decline like that. Of course, Kiryu refuses once again, causing Kuze to get physical, to which Kuze unknowingly then grants Kiryu his wish, 
officially stripping him of his Yakuza status, allowing him to go all out against his superiors. Once the fighting is over, Kiryu finally meets Sohei Dojima, and pleads for the false murder accusation not to be tracked back to Kazuma. But, as Dojima informs him, someone needs to take responsibility for his actions, and since Kiryu is now a civilian, that someone has become Shintaro Kazuma. Feeling defeated, Kitty wanders the streets of Kamurocho, until he meets up with an associate of Kazuma's named Tachibana, a real estate broker with a troubled past of which we learn about much later on. With all this in tow, Kiryu now sets out to prove his innocence and to save his foster father from the clutches of the Dojima family. Meanwhile, in Osaka, a cabaret manager named Goro Majima is taking care of a rowdy customer who refused to pay his bill, somehow or another managing to convince the guy to instead pay everyone else's bill in turn for not being turned over to the cops. Once that's settled, a new problem arises as another customer catches wind of this news and begins drinking alcohol like there's no tomorrow. When Majima goes to stop him from getting a failed liver, he finds out that the man is none other than Tsukasa Sagawa, the owner of the cabaret and, as luck would have it, Majima's parole officer. To give a bit of context on events before the story, Majima was once a member of the Shimano family. One day, however, he was ordered to abandon his sworn brother during a raid, but Majima refused, which resulted in the loss of his left eye and three years of his life being tortured by the Shimano family. However, for some reason, the head of the Shimano family gave Majima the opportunity to redeem himself by allowing him to manage Sagawa's cabaret and making him collect however much money the family needs. But Here's the thing, though despite bringing the cabaret up from the bottom of the barrel and making it into a major attraction that makes money hand over foot, each and every time Majima asks about his exile, he's given a lame response, because Majima is just too dang good at making money for them to let go. However, this all changes when Sagawa gives Majima an offer he can easily refuse. In fact, Sagawa recommends that he does, because if Majima were to go through with said task, it would be something he'd never recover from. The task itself being a hit on a person named Makoto Makimura, a human trafficker who picks up young women off the street and sells them for the highest price. In return for his effort, Shimano will grant him immediate re-entry into the family, ending his oh-so-hated cabaret escapades. With a reward so enticing, Majima accepts the task in spite of Sagawa's warnings, having only two days to complete it with no additional information being provided on Makoto's appearance or where they work in Osaka. With no time to lose, Majima goes to work, looking in every nook and cranny he could possibly find. After a hard day of work asking out college girls and busting some heads at the discotheque, Majima eventually finds Makoto's workplace, a massage parlor near the south end of Osaka. When he enters the parlor, he finds a small blind woman and a grizzly older man, the latter of whom notices Majima's Oni tattoo, but gives him the chance to leave. However, Majima is steadfast in his resolve and begins a death match with the man, assuming that he's Makoto. But thanks to a random Yakuza faction intruding in on the events, Majima finds out that the grizzly older man he just beat up is named Lee, and the small blind woman who's being taken away by Yakuza is Makoto Makimura. The other twist of the story is, there was never any human trafficking going on, or rather, none done by Makoto, confusing Majima as to what to do next. In the midst of his confusion, Majima finds himself helping out Makoto from the Yakuza, but struggles in deciding whether or not to let her live or fulfill his assignment, eventually deciding to back down and let the poor girl live. All this action takes place within the first four chapters of the story, leaving me speechless from how good it all was. It would seem like no time I was able to grow attached to both Kiryu and Majima, hanging on the edge of my seat just to see what happened next to these two. But I'd be lying if I said I liked them both equally. To me at least, Majima outpaced Kiryu by a small margin, and while that's not to downplay Kiryu's character or any of the struggles he faces this early on in the story, in fact I'd say out of the two of them I relate to Kiryu more than Majima, but there's just something about Majima's story and how his cold-blooded conviction was quickly melted away by a helpless blind woman that really gets to me. From here, I became floored with Yakuza 0 as it slowly became the one game I played for months on end. I wanted to find out where exactly the story was going, but unfortunately for me, I quickly became distracted with the actual game portion of this game, delaying any story progress I made for quite some time. If I were to categorize Yakuza 0, I'd say it's a modernized action RPG, keeping series staples like random encounters alive, but changing things ever so slightly to fit a more realistic setting. For example, random encounters can be spotted right before you encounter them. In addition, both characters are given a sprint button to avoid said encounters, but they will tire out after a while without the proper upgrade. After running for a bit, the enemy will of course lose interest in you. However, if you were to fight them, you'd be in for quite the experience. Upon fighting the enemy, you'll notice that after hitting them enough times, money will fly out of them, to which Kiryu and Majima will pilfer to fund their ex-Yakuza needs. In fact, you get a lot of money from fighting them. Like, a lot of money. Sometimes outright doubling the amount you originally had. 
In addition, from time to time, enemies will drop items you can sell at pawn shops for even more cash. This is important because it feeds right into the upgrade system and evasion mechanic exclusive to Yakuza 0. The former being a skill tree where you literally take your money and invest it into a character. And the latter allowing you to skip encounters without the need of sprinting. I find these two exclusives to be rather interesting in terms of implementation, because while their uses are fairly standard for a game, it's the fact that they can be used as a bridge to bring the player into the time frame of the bubble economy Japan had back in the 80s, and show how easy it is to be loose with your money when you have proper justification. I think it's safe to say that in an RPG, we all want to be as strong as possible to either be ready for future fights, or to completely curve stomp the opposition. And, of course, this remains true in Yakuza 0. You want to make Kiryu and Majima as strong as they could possibly be, However, you may be a bit discouraged when you see the later upgrade prices skyrocket into the millions, making one think that this game is very grind-heavy. This all changes by the time you hit the end of the chapter, where in the blink of an eye you'll earn up to a million dollars in no time flat. Even more than that actually, because the game will flat out give you more money for completing the chapter. Upon seeing this, any thought of penny pinching immediately disappears, as you think to yourself, if the game's gonna be this generous, I might as well splurge and get everything I can without breaking bank. This then later sets you up for the evasion mechanic where despite you getting rid of your in-game currency, you are more willing to part with it because the game gives you so much money that 10 grand seems like pocket change in comparison. Eventually though, even 1 million yen won't satisfy, as the more luxurious upgrades will cost even more money in no time flat, leading the player to indulge in yet another monetary plague of the bubble era, and every era around the world before, during, and after 1988, gambling. While Yakuza 0 has many variations of gambling, including poker, catfight bets, and Japanese strategy games, the most effective way is through Mr. Shakedown, a set of four boss characters that roam Kamurocho no Osaka, which act as the game's go-for-broke system. Early on, he is the player's worst nightmare, not only because his damage output is insane, but because he can attack your wallet as well, leaving you with only the clothes on your back in some instances. But even with the stakes so high, you're still willing to risk it all because the potential payout is so great that you can't possibly pass it up. That, and this game is fictional so it's not like you're losing actual money. Getting the player in this mentality through something as simple as changing experience to currency was genius, at least in my opinion. And while this game may have a large emphasis on money, there's something even bigger that Yakuza 0 focuses on, and that's fighting. As I already mentioned, Yakuza 0 is an action RPG. All your inputs are in real time with both characters sharing the same light, heavy dodge, grab, and lock on buttons, making it easy to switch between characters during events of the story. The general combat from an audio-visual standpoint is amazing, and I can't tell you how good it feels to knock someone out in this game. The designers did a spectacular job on selling each hit, having enemies fly back a considerable distance after getting hit with something heavy, and at times having them writhe in pain right in front of you to convey just how strong the characters are. All this carnage being accentuated by an amazing sound design that give the attacks the extra crunch they need to have you reel your head back and go, that must have hurt. In addition to your regular punches and kicks, you also have the style and heat systems, the two things that make the combat more fun than it already is. First and foremost, let's cover styles, seeing as they're the most prominent part of combat you'll be dealing with for the entirety of the game. For lack of a better comparison, a style is similar to that of a stance, changing your character's priorities in combat which affect your damage output, your walking speed, striking speed, and what effect they'll have on your character. There are eight styles equally divided between the two characters of which you'll gain access to over the course of the story. The final two, however, are optional, gated by both characters' game-spanning side quests of which I'll cover later in the video. While styles alone are enough to differentiate both characters' playstyle, what's interesting to note is the different ways they both can implement them in a fight. Kiryu, for example, is combo-centric, with many of his upgrades being centered around combo extensions and special combo enders that'll lay out the opposition. What makes Kiryu's style so interesting to use is the sliding scale of power and speed that each one goes through, with Rush being the fastest of them all, but hits about as hard as wet toilet paper, and Beast being the strongest style Kiryu has in his possession, but it causes him to move at the speed of tectonic plates. Brawler is the in-between of the two, giving a good mix of speed and power, becoming my personal favorite in any and all boss fights. As such, you'll be entering most fights as Brawler to feel out the opposition, then switch to either Rush or Beast depending on how the situation progressed from there. Now, when it comes to Majima, he doesn't exactly have the combo ability of Kiryu. Instead, Majima's styles are centered around what the opposition is currently doing, and what move you can use to stop them from doing it. For example, despite Majima's Thug style being more or less the same to Kiryu's Brawler, Thug has an option to instantly disarm and confiscate a gun wielder's firearm, while Brawler doesn't, having to take them out the old-fashioned way. This distinction is important because gun-wielding enemies are some of the most annoying in the game, as they can topple your character over, leaving them unresponsive to your inputs for quite some time. 
While their health is typically low to compensate for the headache they pose, having a move that instantly turns a table on the opposition is incredible. Similar things apply to Majima Slugger and Breaker styles, as despite sharing similarities with Kiryu styles, they ultimately follow their own game plan of disarming the biggest threat in the room, either by taking away their weapons or by breaking them entirely. While cells on their own are pretty fun to mess around with, they also play into another mechanic known as heat, which is the large meter sitting right underneath your health bar, that fills whenever you successfully land an attack or drains whenever you are attacked. He can be filled up to three stages, each stage giving you a significant boost in your overall speed and giving you access to certain moves. However, when you build up enough heat where your character begins to emit an aura around their body, you'll gain access to heat actions, context sensitive attacks that'll do insane amounts of damage once activated. Heat actions are by far one of the most fun things in the game to mess around with, sometimes providing you the most brutal of carnage to the most nonsensical of beatdowns, and with over a hundred different heat actions to perform, you'll be preoccupied for hours on end. However, activating a heat action has an expense. Using so much heat will knock you down in stages, some of them bring you right down to stage 1, which is the worst stage to be in, no questions asked. Stage 1 are Kiryu and Majima's base form so to speak, and in it you have no speed buffs, making every style harder to get off the ground as you can get knocked out of attack strings more easily due to your attacks not coming out fast enough. Now, using heat isn't as punishing as I made it sound, as you can use items at any point in a fight to refill your heat gauge. However, it's best not to go willy-nilly and waste these items on the same powerful looking heat actions because the game does scale down damage depending on how many times you use that heat action during a fight. The scale down damage being rather significant to boot, dealing less than half max damage within two uses. Combat has one more tiny inclusion to it called weapons, which depending on the type of person you are can either act as your ace in the hole for certain scenarios, or collect virtual dust in your inventory. Speaking personally, I found myself falling into the latter category, as while weapons can give you bonus effects like guns toppling enemies over, or tasers paralyzing the opposition, they all have a very limited moveset in comparison to your regular styles. But you probably won't notice that due to how fast they break when used in an actual fight, leading you to seek out repairs on a somewhat regular basis. Thankfully though, you don't have to repair all your weapons, as a majority of the time, Kamurocho and Osaka are just littered in objects to which you can use at your discretion. I acknowledge that weapons are definitely useful in a pinch, but I just find the process of repairing them along with their limited movesets to be a deal breaker, especially considering the other options the game provides to you with little to no cost. Speaking of things I didn't get much use out of, Yakuza 0 also has an armor system. Armor in Yakuza 0 feels rather inconsequential in terms of combat, as in, they make your numbers go up, but at no point does it ever feel like there's a significant difference in the damage you do with or without your armor on. Instead, you'll be using armor for its secondary effects that they have in the overworld, like having an enemy tracker so you can find Mr. Shakedown more easily, or a car tracker to find these loot cards so you can go watch more soft core videos. That being said, there are some secondary effects that do help you out in combat, such as paralysis and bullet protection, but I can't say how effective they were because during game play, I forgot they even existed. However, combat isn't all there is to Yakuza 0. As you'll quickly find out, there are so many things you can do within a few seconds of exploring the city. Conversely, from an open world game, Yakuza 0 has two small cities to explore, both of which take around 8 to so minutes to traverse in their entirety. But what the game lacks in scale, it makes up for in sheer density, as there are a lot of things to do and a lot of mini games to play such as the aforementioned gambling and catfight bets with the addition of shogi, fishing, mahjong, and karaoke. You can even visit various restaurants and supermarkets, play the oddly addictive Pocket City Racing with a bunch of kids, or with the emulated rigs of classic Sega games like OutRun, Space Harrier, and Fantasy Zone. It's cool to see these citizens have a place to relax and enjoy themselves, and seeing as there is a lot of variety and activity in both cities, it's easy for me to believe that multiple people live there. Because, well, they do. At least in the case of Osaka. Unfortunately though, nothing is perfect, and as far as the world design for Osaka goes specifically, it can get pretty iffy when it comes to fighting. See, what happens when a fight is initiated is that the game forms invisible walls around a specific area that prevents you from leaving. While this by itself isn't so bad, you also have to factor in the rather tight passageways of Osaka, which cause the invisible walls to get even closer than they normally would be, restricting the camera's movement in certain scenarios. Now, to be fair, I've only noticed this problem during Mr. Shakedown fights and a very few number of them at that, seeing as they require much more defensive play to take on properly. Not to mention that Osaka is a recreation of an actual physical location, so some growing pains from this transition are to be expected, as cities are meant to be lived in and not served as battlegrounds for cool street fights, although that's not to say they can't do both at the same time. Another problem I'd like to mention are the visuals, which are a mixed bag at best. 
Sometimes the graphics look amazing, going as far to show incredibly small details on a character such as their individual pores, and outside of major cutscenes, the graphics look no better than a late PlayStation 2 title. Now, to be fair, Yakuza 0 wasn't developed for the PlayStation 4, but for the PlayStation 3, then was later ported to 4 for Western releases. But even with this in mind, it doesn't exactly save it from criticism, as things like texture work or in-game models outside of the main cast, and some animations look like they were rushed out of a gate to meet a deadline. It's not a deal breaker by any means, but it's a very noticeable part of the game that's pretty hard to ignore. One of the last thing Yakuza 0 has to offer in terms of gameplay are the sub-stories, which can be accessed by running around certain sections of Kamurocho and Osaka. None of these sub-stories have any bearing on the overall story, and are often extremely zany adventures that Kiryu and Majima get into while walking around their cities. In fact, these sub-stories are so damn zany that they run headlong with the uber-serious tone of Yakuza 0's story. This creates a tonal dissonance between the narrative and the sub-stories that's honestly so jarring it's hard not to do a double take when you first encounter them. For example, in the story you can have a serious conversation with Tachibana discussing his harsh childhood, only to then run into a man known as Mr. Libido where he asks you to show him pictures of hot girls and shares with you who he thinks is the best looking actress he's found in recent memory. Strange as it may be for a character like that to exist in a game so dark, the weirdest part about all of this is that it works extremely well together. Sure, Yakuza 0's sub-stories can have a consistent tone with the narrative, making everything super serious and somewhat depressing, but I think it's better that they went this route, because it provides a break in tension for the literal hour or so the player just spent listening to, or in my case reading, some heavy dialogue involving racism, torture, trafficking, and the list goes on. This does wonders for keeping an extremely long and dark game feeling fresh and fun. The best part about this is that it's entirely optional, so if you're the type of person that wants the story to be serious without brief moments of levity, you can have that completely uninterrupted. Among the sub-stories are two particular adventures that can span the whole game, in which completing them will get you Kiryu and Majima's final two styles, the Dragon of Dojima for Kiryu and the Mad Dog of Shimano for Majima. First and foremost, let's talk about the Dragon of Dojima, seeing as it's the one that'll replace all your regular styles in no time flat. To put it simply, the Dragon of Dojima incorporates aspects of each of Kiryu's styles and puts them into one, making it a jack of all trades. Well, this means that it doesn't specialize in any one thing and it doesn't have the unique abilities of the singular styles, the Dragon of Dojima style makes up for it in utility as you have everything you could possibly want at your fingertips. The Dragon of Dojima style has great speed, good damage, mid-combo command grabs, on-the-ground grabs, counters, and an awesome white aura flowing around you whenever you reach max heat. The Mad Dog of Shimano style is Majima's most offensive style, having little reactionary moves as it works on dealing a lot of damage with his lunge attack, which puts Majima into an auto-run state. In this state, you can attack multiple times with Majima's lunge attack, so long as you don't whiff an attempt or have enough heat to perform this move in the first place. The Mad Dog of Shimano's permanent weapon, the Demon Fire Knife, also has a piercing effect on blocking enemies, making most fights, including bosses, even easier than they already were. Along with these two new styles, both Kiryu and Majima will gain one more skill tree. This skill tree is the same for both characters, giving out no new moves but small upgrades to your max health, damage, heat action damage, and how much heat you receive when attacking. The amount of money needed for these skill trees is astronomical, but it's worth it in the long run, as the moment you complete the skill tree, the tree resets with all the previous buffs intact, allowing you to do it all over again. With enough time and patience, you can make your already absurdly strong characters even stronger, making the rest of the game borderline unplayable as a result. However, there is one hurdle preventing you from breaking the game in two, that being the Limit Break ability which you need to purchase from the CP Exchange Shrines in Kamurocho and or Osaka. What does CP stand for, I hear myself asking? Well, it stands for Completion Points, which can be obtained by doing menial tasks in the overworld, such as beating a certain number of enemies in a certain style, eating all the food in a restaurant, or playing a minigame. Unfortunately, you can't get Limit Break without going through a few mandatory purchases. But not only are they pretty cheap in comparison, they're also useful to boot, so it kind of balances itself out. Not only that, but you get CP just for breathing in this game, so mandatory purchases are a complete non-issue in my eyes. While I could go on about how good these two styles are, I'd like to take some time to discuss the side missions you play to get them, as they're both worth commentating on in my opinion. First off, we have Kiryu's real estate management, in which case you take a large sum of money the game doles out to you and purchase some stores around Kamurocho. Having these stores will allow you to make a profit without so much as lifting a finger, so long as the people you hire are all at the top of their game. In addition, having a monopoly on a certain portion of Kamurocho will set you up with two encounters with one of the five billionaires, the people who run certain sections of Kamurocho from the shadows. The first encounter is a competition in a mini-game of the billionaire's choice, the victor gaining 10% of the loser's shares, with the second encounter being a straight-up fight where, once again, you gain 10% of the loser's shares, 
Plus, the billionaire along with their top thug will join your crusade to take back Kamurocho. In between these encounters, it should be noted that the billionaires will attempt to halt your income flow by sending thugs to your stores depending on what area you're attempting to monopolize, leading to you getting your hands dirty from time to time, but nothing too serious in the grand scheme of things. What really makes the substory for me is that not only do the five billionaires join your side, but most of the citizens throughout the substories join you as well. This also happens in Majima's substory to a degree, but to me, here it feels a little more like a community coming together to uproot the dark hand taking hold of Kamurocho. However, I can't really say I enjoy this beyond its initial few minutes, as the real estate substory has really nothing going for it, consisting of you waiting on time limits to end so you can get more money to buy more property. Now, to be fair, you can upgrade said time limits at shrines so that they take less time to end. And for this substory only, you are allowed to run out and do other activities as well, so you have something to do to kill time. But this can only last you as long as you have other activities such as substories to complete. If you don't have any, or they become hard to find due to their dwindling numbers, you'll find yourself anxiously waiting for time limits to end. Majima, on the other hand, has it a lot better in the Cabaret Club, as the side quest is much more involved than Kiryu's is. In the Cabaret Club, you can hire a set number of girls to work the staff for the night. How it works is that you set them up with your customers and wait for the girls to call you over, in which case you have to memorize their hand signs in order to have a certain amount of their health refill along with boosting the customer's mood. While the game does want you to remember these signs, there's no harm in waiting a bit if you forget them because the game will tell you what the girl wants, but her health won't regenerate nearly as much, nor will the customer's mood get a boost. Upon helping the girls out and getting the spirited customer to spend more money, a small bar will fill up allowing you to activate Sunshine Fever, which will cause the customers to go on a spending frenzy for a short period of time, and result in you getting a bigger payout by the end of the workday. Note that Sunshine Fever can be filled up to three bars, each level increasing the amount of customers it affects. However, despite this, I found it best to let it rip as soon as you get it, for reasons I'll explain in a second. Just like Kiryu, Majima will be going up against five cabaret club owners, this time gaining a monopoly on fans in the area of Osaka. This competition occasionally leading you into a fistfight with a club's owner. In terms of competition, the only way for you to win is to have a higher payout at the end of the workday. Now, for the first four managers, this is pretty easy, all things considered. In fact, it's so easy you'll be able to use level 3 fever without a care in the world. But for the fifth and final cabaret club battle, don't even think about it, as their fever bar moves way too fast to compete with as it uses full effect of the opposition's exclusive ability, in which case they can steal away your customers. That is, unless you activate your own Sunshine Fever and use its ability to hunker down two customers at a time, while simultaneously depleting the opposition's bar by a small portion, giving you some leeway in the battle. Now, the Cabaret Club has a lot more to it than what I'm mentioning here, such as dressing up the girls, going out with them, and paying attention to the customers' requests. But, aside from the dating portion, I didn't pay too much attention to the other features because they were so simple as look at the smiley face or double circle, and do said option no matter what the game told you to do in the instructions. On top of this, dating the girls gives Majima a straight shot to the karaoke bar, where Majima delivers his best performance yet. <laughs> The song's name is 24 Hour Cinderella, and I can't tell you how much fun it is to listen to this bubbly upbeat song. But what makes this even better, aside from Majima's 80s as hell attire, is that he actually gives a damn about singing it and puts his all into his performance. Hell, if other substories are anything to go by, then Majima knows the song by heart and is willing to break it out whenever he sees fit. The Cabaret Club was spectacular, as it provided me with so many laughs and surprisingly engaging gameplay that by the end of it, I couldn't help but fall in love with it and miss it all the same when I had completed everything in the game. Speaking of which, now that we're done talking about the game, why don't we get back into the story and wrap that up as well. After leaving the Dojima family and continuing to cause problems for them long after his departure, Kiryu has now become the entire family's target, mainly due to his connections with Tachibana, who has been a major competitor in the race to get the empty lot for quite some time now. To say the Dojimas go all out making Kiryu's life a living hell would be an understatement, as it seems that everyone showed up just to take a piss on Kiryu's face, whether it be from burning his house to the ground or straight up assaulting him in the sewers. All of this being spearheaded by the second Lieutenant Owano, who wants to use the chaos to drive Kiryu to his side, hoping that by hammering him enough, he'll break and sell out Kazuma. But when all this fails and Kiryu stands strong against all the attacks, Owano devolves into empty threats that, yet again, fail to affect Kiryu as he strolls out of the building uncontested by any Yakuza. In a brief moment of peace, Kiryu encounters Nishiyama, who drives him far outside the city limits in order to get him away from the Dojima family. 
In fact, Nishikiyama drives them a little too far, only stopping when the two of them have reached a literal dead end in the middle of the woods. When Kiryu stops and takes a smoke break, Nishikiyama pulls a gun on him, threatening to kill his brother not for the Dojimas, but for his own good. See, Nishikiyama knows just how much the Dojima family is capable of in terms of torture, knowing that they'll let Kiryu live by a hair just to watch him squirm. Not wanting to see his brother live through that hell, Nishikiyama plans to kill Kiryu himself as swiftly as humanly possible. However, despite getting Kiryu to give the okay, there's just one problem. No matter how hard Nishikiyama tries to justify it to himself, he simply can't do it. Frustrated at his own inability to act, Nishikiyama falls to his knees and begins sobbing, as he comes to the realization that without Kiryu, he's nothing, with Kiryu coming to the same realization, saying that talking cool about how dying would make everything easier proves that they're nothing more than just kids. In the midst of their conversation, Nishikiyama proposes that they team up to fight the Dojima family together, but Kiryu refuses, telling him to forget everything that happened as he severs their sworn brotherhood to prevent anything from coming Nishikiyama's way, as he heads back into Kamurocho to handle some unfinished business. I make no exaggeration when I say that this is one of the best cutscenes in the entire game. The sheer emotion emanating from Nishiyama's actor, the cracks in his shaky voice, it's all just way too good to pass by without saying anything. In fact, the scene was so damn good that it served as the inspiration for me making this video in the first place, managing to give me a lump in my throat when I first saw it, and almost getting me to cry as well. Almost. In any case, when Kiryu returns, the situation only gets worse, with more Dojima family members patrolling the streets, harassing if anyone's seen Kiryu, and beating up anyone who looks similar to him. With nowhere left to go, Kiryu takes refuge in a small bar named Serena, thanks to the bartender, Rena, doing a bit of convincing on Kiryu's behalf. But even this doesn't last long as the Dojima family quickly surround the place and overwhelm Kiryu with sheer numbers. When all seems lost, Kiryu is saved by Tachibana's bad driving as he runs over Kuze, clearing a path through a sea of Yakuza. As expected though, neither of them can keep this up forever, leading them to seek help from the Tojo clan directly, forking over a million yen to get the Dojima family off Kiryu's back, but only after fighting their way out of Tojo HQ. Once the deed is done, the Dojima family comply in leaving Kiryu alone. However, that doesn't mean that they're out of the woods just yet, as both Tachibana and the final lieutenant Shibusawa send their men to Osaka to pick up the owner of the lot, Makoto Makimura. Meanwhile in Osaka, Majima goes through his own hell, as Lee attempts to convince him to kill a person who looks exactly like Makoto, and dress her up in Makoto's uniform in order to throw Sagawa off their trail. Majima refuses, but that doesn't stop a murder from going through, much to their surprise. Before either of them can speculate on what happened, the killer immediately reveals himself to be a man named Nishitani head of the Kijin family, or the Yakuza group who tried to kidnap Makoto earlier in the story. As their conversation continues, Nishitani proposes a trade for Makoto, already fulfilling his end of the agreement by eliminating the woman that looked exactly like her, and is now waiting on Majima to agree to his part. However, Majima refuses, instigating a fight with Nishitani that the cops later break up. With him out of the picture and Sagawa thoroughly convinced that the hit has been completed, Majima rushes to Lee to get Makoto out of Osaka as quickly as possible. Thankfully, Majima sorted out every problem they could possibly run into, so so from here on out, everything is... Did I forget to mention the part where Majima thinks Sagawa doesn't buy their lie? Because he doesn't, and he ends up killing Lee for Majima's betrayal. Injured from the force of the explosion, Majima is pinned to the ground, unable to stop the approaching Sagawa who raises a gun at the unconscious Makoto. But, as fate would have it, she's saved by an unknown shooter who ends up kidnapping her himself. After being taught a lesson by Sagawa, Majima goes out looking for info on the stranger, finding out thanks to Nishitani that the shooter is named Masaru Seta, head of the Nikyo Consortium, an underground group that operates for the Toe clan, doing jobs that even Yakuza don't want their name on. Despite the foreboding message and the assailant that ends up killing Nishitani, Majima makes a beeline for Seta, with Sagawa forcefully tagging along for the ride. Once there, the two split up, leaving Majima to encounter Seta alone. After beating Seta's face in, he immediately complies to almost all of Majima's demands, telling him why Yakuza are chasing after Makoto, but not where he's put her, asking Majima to trust him that she's in good hands. While Majima does hesitate, he ultimately puts his faith in Seta, but Sagawa, on the other hand, doesn't, as he shoots Seta in the back and takes a business card from his breast pocket, revealing both Kiryu and Tachibana's names as well as their workplace being stationed in Kamurocho. As we cut away from this scene, we see that earlier in the night, Kiryu and Tachibana's right-hand man Oda had taken Makoto to Kamurocho. However, despite having a head start in the competition, they're intercepted by Shibusawa, who begins a massive firefight over the highway, forcing Kiryu and the others to duck inside a construction site to shake off the heat. At the construction site, Oda attempts to kill both Kiryu and Makoto, but is surprised by a hidden blade in Makoto's cane, Kurt 
courtesy of Seta. As Oda bleeds out, he reveals that not only is he the rat that sold him out to Shibusawa, but he is in some regard partially responsible for Makoto's blindness, selling her to the Koreans back in his human trafficking days, who then proceeded to torture her day in and day out, eventually causing her to go blind. But why did Oda sell them out to Shibusawa? Well, it was to protect his own ass, knowing that if Makoto reached their destination, he'd probably die due to the fact that she's Tachibana's sister, who were separated in their youth, to escape the racism he faced in China for being half Japanese and more than likely wouldn't let something like this go unpunished. Except he totally would as we see in a later cutscene. Regardless, he conjured this whole scheme hoping to use Shibusawa as the fall guy for the murder as he got off scot-free. But in the midst of explaining this, Oda has a change of heart due to Makoto being an actual angel and ends up distracting Shibusawa, asking Kiryu to tell Tachibana that he loved him, which allows Kiryu and Makoto to flee to Kamurocho, finding sanctuary in a hobo camp behind some washrooms in the upper right corner of the city. Once settled in the hobo camp, Kiryu runs over to Tachibana, attempting to bring him over so Makoto can sign the property to him. At Little China, as Kiryu tells Tachibana of Oda's demise, Tachibana informs Kiryu that he's figured out the person who's framed him to be none other than Sohei Dojima himself, wanting to frame Kiryu so that he had an excuse to kick Kazuma out of the clan, as he's been the one thing preventing him from obtaining the head seat in the Tojo clan. But as Kiryu gets Tachibana to leave, they're ambushed by a man who Tachibana manages to identify as the best Chinese assassin, Lao Wei. His presence in Kamurocho tipping him off that he was the man that killed Taichi earlier in the story. As the assassin proceeds to open fire on Kiryu, Tachibana steps in to offer himself to the assassin in hopes to spare Kiryu's life. Now in the custody of the Dojima family, Tachibana is tortured for information on Makoto. But before they can get anything out of him, he's murdered by one of Kuzei's underlings who failed to heed Kuzei's orders to keep him alive. After pummeling Kuzei's face in for the umpteenth time, Majima arrives in Kamurocho, only to be pulled aside by Shimano himself to discuss new developments in Makoto's hit. Surprisingly, there's only good news to hear as Shimano calls off the hit and orders the two to capture Makoto instead revealing that this was all part of his master plan to have Makoto give them the empty lot, with Majima unknowingly playing his part to a T, becoming the one person Makoto can trust due to Sagawa's itchy trigger finger, making him the most likely person to receive the lot. Distraught after hearing how easily his emotions were manipulated, Majima goes into a stint, wandering the streets of Kamurocho until he meets Makoto again, who seems a bit off her rocker. Tachibana's death hit Makoto pretty hard, so much so that she flew off the deep end crying for the blood of the three lieutenants that killed him. Despite Majima's efforts to calm her down, Makoto goes straight to Sohei Dojima himself and requests the heads of the lieutenants as payment for the empty lot. Of course, this doesn't pan out too well as she ends up getting shot for her troubles. With Makoto dead, the Dojima family now have free reign to continue on the project as normal. But thanks to a last minute aid from Seta, Majima is able to get Makoto to the ER where she can receive proper treatment and hopefully regain consciousness. With Makoto now in good hands, Majima storms out of the hospital and heads towards Dojima HQ to fulfill Makoto's request and kill the three lieutenants. Finally recovering from his bullet wounds, Kiryu encounters Seta once again, telling him that Makoto has been moved to the consortium's boat for safety reasons so that when she wakes up she can sign over the lot to him and fulfill Kazuma's true goal, to get Seta to the head of the Tojo clan and to simultaneously knock the Dojimas out of their rising power. As Seta informs Kiryu that there's nothing more for him to do, Nishikiyama runs in saying that Shibusawa has not only become captain, but is now starting starting a manhunt for everyone in Kazuma's corner, including Kiryu and himself. As they go to warn Kashiwagi, Kiryu encounters Kuze, again, and proceeds to beat his ass, again. Despite the tone of my voice, I really do enjoy this fight a lot. If you couldn't tell by now, Kuze is Kiryu's rival character, and if I'm being honest, he's pretty standard for the role, but damn it if I don't like him regardless. When the game started, I didn't care for him at all, with his early attempts to manipulate Kiryu making him pretty easy to hate. However, as the game continued, I found myself respecting him a bit more and more, coming to understand his reasoning for being a Yakuza as he went from being a character I hated to one I got a legitimate kick out of every time I fought him. This final fight being the icing on the proverbial cake where you can see the respect the two have gained for each other over the course of the game come to the forefront, being present in the way Kiyu decides to redress Kuze as Sir while referring to the other lieutenants by their names only, and Kuze openly admitting that egging Kiryu on was a mistake, and that now more than ever, he's on his way to becoming a true Yakuza. It may sound kinda cheesy, but this line put a huge smile on my face when I first heard it, as it gave Kiryu the recognition he rightly deserved. But, as Kuze finishes complimenting Kiryu, he informs him that Shibusawa used the injured Makoto to lead him to Seta's boat, and is planning on killing her, Seta, and anyone else associated with Kazuma. With no time to lose, Kiryu races down to the boat to rescue Makoto, encountering the rest of Shibusawa's men at the docks. Thanks to a last minute assist from Kashiwagi, paving the path clear of any opposition, Kiryu makes his way to Shibusawa where he reveals his motivation for starting a war with the Kazuma family. As Shibusawa puts it, he's attained just about everything he could possibly want in life. However, there is one thing he currently lacks. Glory. 
Learning from his father who committed suicide working his ass off for a corrupt politician who later threw him under the bus, Shibasawa decided to do away with effort and snuff out the biggest fish in the pond, being Kazuma, along with the heir to his ethos being Kiryu. That way he can obtain all of his glory and in the process draft his own title, becoming the Dragon of Dojima. Of course, this infuriates Kiryu as he tells Shibusawa that the blood he spilt to make such a title was unnecessary and that he could have drafted with his own blood, to which Shibusawa points out that the blood of others is exactly how Kazuma started on his path, and how he continues down it to this day, knowingly sending guys like Tachibana to an early grave by having them stick their neck out to prevent Dojima from getting any more power. After dropping that bomb, Shibusawa goes on to reveal that just like Kiryu, he too has a dragon tattoo, and believes that there should be only one dragon flying in Kamurocho, a notion to which Kiryu surprisingly agrees with. With no more words to be exchanged between the two, their fight for the title of dragon begins. As they square off, Majima encounters Iwano in the Dojima family, where Iwano begins explaining his backstory on how he loved to beat people up, but decided that bathing in their money was a lot easier than bathing in the blood of his enemies. As their fight winds to a close, it seems that Majima, in a twist of irony, has gained a bit of respect for the man he's come to kill. The same being true of Iwano, as he wonders what life would be like if he just acted stupid for once. But, as it turns out, Iwano's newfound respect for Majima's idiot gets him killed, as he stands defiantly in Lao Gue's line of fire. Now even more pissed off, Majima takes on Wolverine. After the two protagonists have their final battles, both of them are ready to kill the opposition, but are stopped by Nishikiyama, who begs Kiryu not to cross the line just yet, pleading to him that whenever the time comes, they will cross it together, and Seta, who informs Majima that Makoto is still alive, and that by going through with his revenge scheme, he'd be giving Makoto a large debt she can never repay, saddling her with the guilt that she's free because Majima got his hands dirtier than they should have been, similar to how he felt when his sworn brother took on that raid without him. After calming Majima down, Seta then takes custody of Lao Gue, using him as a bargaining chip with Dojima to keep him away from Makoto, as he then reveals that he is the owner of the empty lot and begins to price gouge Dojima for all the lot is worth. As the dust settles and the tension fades, the two Yakuza slip back into their ordinary lives, with Kiryu going back to the Dojima family because he feels that it's necessary to go back, that way he can square away some stuff. What is this stuff? I don't know. Hell, Kiryu himself doesn't know either. But despite that, he's determined to find his own path in life. And to do so, he can't run away from anything, even if the thing he's running away from are the people who framed him and attempted to murder him. Aside from Kiryu's questionable reasoning for joining the Dojima family again, I really like this scene for Kiryu's character, as it holds the most growth he has in the entirety of the game. From minute one of Yakuza 0, we're told that both Kiryu and Ishikiyama became Yakuza out of admiration for Kazuma, despite Kazuma doing everything in his power to prevent his sons from becoming Yakuza, only losing out to Kiryu who managed to pull the orphan card, breaking Kazuma's conviction, as he let his sons become Yakuza the next day. From then on, Kiryu still held a lot of admiration for Kazuma, basically designing most of his life after him. This all comes to a head in the Shibusawa fight, where just like Kiryu, Shibusawa too looks up to Kazuma, but aims to surpass him, while Kiryu wants to be just like him, thematically making the fight about two men who live in Kazuma's shadow. This theme is then reinforced by Shibusawa egging Kiryu on to be more like Kazuma and murder him during the end of the fight, becoming what Shibusawa and a majority of the Dojima family would consider to be a true Yakuza. While Kiryu may not have stopped himself, it's thanks to people like Nishikiyama and all the other people Kiryu met on this journey that help him find solace in being his own person instead of copying someone else. This is taken a step further in this scene where Kiryu wants to make his own style of Yakuza instead of copying Kazuma. This is a really nice arc that Kiryu goes through that really makes me appreciate his later superhero-esque no kill rule, also helping as a neat characterization Yakuza 0 gives Kiryu, making him a hot-headed child whose impulsive actions end up making the situation worse for not only himself, but for everyone else involved, running juxtaposition with his later self who was a much more calm and well-rounded person. As we cut away from this scene, we see Majima talking to Sagawa, telling him that after the night he had, he's decided to do away with sanity and live his life as crazy as possible, while also being as tenacious as Sagawa, giving his respects to the man who just wouldn't quit no matter what came his way. Out of all the cutscenes in Yakuza 0, this is the one I find to be the most interesting, seeing as Majima's crazy actions are one of his most defining traits in the entirety of the series. And to see that it's more or less an act done so that he can live his life to the fullest is what turned Majima into my favorite character in the entire franchise. First and foremost, I appreciate how calm Majima talks about this despite the actual trauma he just went through the previous night. It's a neat little subversion of expectation considering how into the whole craziness thing he gets in later games. But aside from that, when you look at Majima's later actions in the series, isolated, it's easy to read him as the crazy guy doing crazy guy things, but with the context of Yakuza 0, it paints him as more of a sad clown. Majima's life sucks, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He was forced to betray his brother, got manipulated like a puppet, and watched just about everyone he made the slightest bond with die 
right in front of his face. But even though he has every right to feel sorrowful, he decides to do the opposite and cut loose, doing whatever the hell he feels like no matter how childish or odd that thing may be. He's trying to make the most of his life before the inevitable hits him like a 51 year old man who just broke out of jail, which is something I believe we all can relate to. After saying his goodbyes, Hitman approach Sagawa and shoot him on sight, due to Shimano throwing him under the bus to cover his ass for killing the leader of the Omi Alliance, who he planned to sell the empty lot to, but decided to bail when he heard Sera had his eyes on him. It's not clear if this information is ever relayed to Majima, though I doubt he care all too much given their relationship. But what is clear is that Majima's back in the Shimano family, which is the first thing he tries to suppress as he clocks two of his own men from bragging about it in front of a certain formerly blind girl. I forgot to mention this earlier, but apparently Makoto was suffering from psychogenic blindness, a condition where stress and anxiety can cause a person to lose their sight. However, since there is no physical cause behind their blindness, it is possible for them to get better over time. However, instead of talking to her, Majima decides to ignore her, wanting to keep her away from any more Yakuza business. Thankfully, Majima finds her with another man who loves her enough to raise his fist to a Yakuza and leaves her in his care, but not before giving her one final gift, fixing a watch he had broken early in the story and leaving it in the empty lot for her to find. With nothing left to cover, the game ends, showing a post credit scene that, in some time in the future, Kiryu and Majima meet up in Kamurocho, with Majima's vernacular implying that the two have met before. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Yakuza 0, one of the best games I've played in recent memory. Is it perfect? No, of course not. Everything has its problems, and I'm sure that a lot of you have become quite familiar with Yakuza 0's problems during the course of this video. But, from my perspective, they're nowhere near detrimental enough to hold the game back, especially in the case of its combat system, writing, acting, and characters, which are all phenomenal in their own right. If you're ever interested in getting into the Yakuza franchise, I can definitely point to Zero as a viable starting point. But, I will concede, the start here would be... rather odd, at least in terms of combat. See, Yakuza 0 is a 10th anniversary title for the Yakuza series, meaning that everything that was put into this game was done by a team with over 10 years of experience under their belts. As such, Yakuza 0 has a few features that no other game in the lineup has, except for Kiwami. If you're going to start here, I think it's best to temper your expectations for the other titles as they're quite limited and old for lack of a better term. But, if you can keep that in mind, I'd say go for it. This game is one hell of a time, and with its recent release on Steam, with Kiwami coming onto the platform sometime soon, there has never been a better time to invest in the series. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. If you like what you saw, please consider donating to my Patreon page or my PayPal account at dealsider.com. However, if you can't spare the change, please consider sharing it out to anyone you think may be interested in it. I also have a Twitter or Twitch account to which you can find links for in the description. The former is where I post updates to videos coming out, and the latter is where I occasionally stream games. Unfortunately though, I am very sporadic in updating them, which is something that I'm going to have to fix moving forward. An update video should be out sometime soon, explaining what's been happening since my last video. And with all that being said, thank you all once again for watching, and take care.